Hello everyone, Anthony here from Succeeding in Nursing School, and today we'll be talking about arguably the most important topic for anyone interested in ICU care, and one of my personal favorite topics to discuss, sepsis. We'll be discussing in-depth pathophysiology, progression of the disease, and minor bits of treatment as I want to have the main emphasis of this video be on the underlying mechanisms of sepsis. To begin, we need to understand what sepsis is. Well, sepsis is an infection of the bloodstream accompanied by at least two of these following four criteria. Tachypnea, or respiratory rate above 20, tachycardia, or heart rate above 100, an elevated WBC count above 10,000, or one below 3,500, and a fever generally above 101 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Sepsis often can be confused with a condition known as SIRS, or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, as they are both diagnosed by the same four criterion and present similarly. However, the presence of an infection is what distinguishes sepsis from SIRS, along with more pronounced systemic symptoms. Sepsis begins with proliferation of bacteria, either directly in the bloodstream or by progression of an untreated infection. The most common instances of bloodborne sepsis are from deep lacerations providing open access to vasculature and contamination of any kind of peripheral or central line. The most common infections that transition into sepsis are going to be pneumonia, osteomyelitis, UTIs, and any kind of gastrointestinal infection, but mainly peritonitis. And these are going to be accentuated in your elderly population, especially with UTIs, as they often go undiagnosed until they are fairly progressed. So once bacteria enter the bloodstream, a large cascade of cellular responses begin, starting with the release and activation of cytokines. Cytokines are chemical messengers that play a large role in mediating inflammation. And in sepsis, they are responsible for the release of multiple inflammatory mediators, namely tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. These mediators cause alterations in cellular apoptosis and capillary permeability, initializing the third spacing that is so prevalent within sepsis. So with a little diagram I have here, we're going to have these little circles in this blood vessel represent bacteria. And then right here, I'll show you guys my wonderful drawing. So right here, got your blood vessel, and then inside those little circles are your bacteria. So once you have these, like I said, we had the release of cytokines. So what happens is this interferes with the normal osmotic or oncologic pressure within the blood vessel. It's going to cause an increase in capillary permeability, drawing fluid out of the intravascular space, leading to vasodilation. Now at the same time, the presence of bacteria combined with the inflammatory response causes damage to the endothelial lining of the blood vessels, resulting in the release of clotting factors, activation of the coagulation cascade, and release of nitric oxide. So now, we're going to place little X's along our blood vessel right here to represent damage on the lining. Put that up so you guys can see it. Those X's are the damage. So now we have release of nitric oxide, which we're going to be represented by NO. And then we're going to have filled in circles, which are going to represent the microthrombi caused by thrombin release and from platelet aggregation. So you see the nitric oxide there, closed in circles, it's kind of blurry, I can't really get it to focus, but you see it all there. So as thrombin is released and it acts on fibrinogen to form these fibrin clots, the platelets also begin to aggregate and form the microthrombi throughout the body as the extent of endothelial damage is so vast due to the presence of the bacteria in the bloodstream. This results in depletion of clotting factors, placing the patient at risk for developing thrombocytopenia, and the spontaneous hemorrhage of platelets and clotting factors continue to drop low enough. This is also known as a condition called disseminating intravascular coagulation, or DIC. This is just a result of sepsis. The nitric oxide that is released, also caused due to endothelial damage, is responsible for the mass vasodilation that occurs in sepsis, resulting in tachycardia and hypotension. This vasodilation also has a small effect on capillary permeability, resulting in the loss of even more intravascular fluid, causing a sort of not really positive feedback loop, but one that kind of feeds on itself. So eventually, if left untreated, the infection and its subsequent effects on the vasculature and blood pressure become so pronounced the body can no longer meet its metabolic needs. 
at which point septic shock develops. Septic shock is characterized by development of metabolic acidosis resulting from inadequate tissue perfusion and vasodilation so pronounced that it requires the use of vasopressors just to maintain the blood pressure. Once septic shock develops, the pronounced effects on the cardiovascular system are actually accentuated by the development of acidosis. During acidosis, potassium ions in cardiac tissue are forced to leave the cell in order to permit influx of hydrogen ions which causes a decrease in contractile force, further decrease in cardiac output. At this point, without medical treatment, the patient is likely going to be comatose, if not extremely delirious and fatigued, and dead within a few hours, as blood pressure will continue to fall with systolic values going down to about 60 millimeters of mercury before the patient enters cardiac arrest. Numerous complications arise from sepsis and septic shock from every single system in the body, whether as a result of the disease state itself or from the treatment needed to save the patient. Development of acute renal failure is generally one of the first signs of sepsis as the marked vasodilation decreases the amount of renal perfusion occurring, causing a decreased urine output as a result of acetemia. This acute renal failure can also be accentuated by certain antibiotics, mainly vancomycin if it's needed to be able to treat the infection. Acute lung failure may also be the first sign of, of worsening sepsis or development of septic shock, as it is the most common type of organ failure in the ICU, affecting upwards of 50% of people in the ICU. This results when the ventilatory efforts of the patient are not able to meet metabolic needs, either as a result of diminished respiratory muscle function or drive, or from damage to the lungs themselves. Both of these reasons occur in sepsis. However, pulmonary edema is the main cause of this due to increased capillary permeability, allowing fluid to leak through the alveolar capillary membranes, resulting in alveolar destruction and VQ mismatch. Decreased perfusion in the GI tract may also occur, which, if left untreated, is potentially the most life-threatening organ failure and sepsis outside of respiratory and cardiovascular collapse. When the mesenteric blood flow is diminished, peristalsis of the GI tract halts and bacteria begins to flourish. If left in this state, the bacteria will actually begin to eat through the intestine, especially E. coli, which can result in a profound infection involving multiple organisms with multiple types, including anaerobes, aerobes, gram-positives, and gram-negatives, which will create an infection that the patient will almost have no chance of surviving even with medical intervention. And as a result of treatment with vasopressors, blood supply to the extremities, which is already being limited due to the vasodilation, mainly the fingers and toes, is going to decrease even further, which for some patients results in the amputation of one or multiple fingers and toes, all the way to entire hands and feet, or even entire parts of a lower leg. Annually, sepsis is a result of over 750,000 hospitalizations and 210,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. Understanding how sepsis works will allow us to hopefully, if not prevent its transition to septic shock entirely, allow us to be more prepared for what complications we'll be facing and improve patient outcomes, despite the growing threat of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Preventing these complications is going to help improve patient mortality and should be one of the cornerstones of nursing and education, as the signs and symptoms of sepsis can develop rather slowly, but however, they progress rapidly. So that is all I'm going to be talking about today in this video. As always, if you liked it, like the video, comment on what kind of videos you'd like to see in the future, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much. Have a good one.